coming up next. Stay tuned to learn more about student interest in blockchain technology. Reimagine 2020. Hi, I'm Arnold, software engineer of LTO Network, and I'm, I'm excited to be here at uh, Reimagine 2020. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Reimagine 2020. I'm your host, Adam, with another very special guest in the house, a project that we've been following and very fortunate to have uh, Arnold's time here uh, to join us during Reimagine, during this, this virtual conference. Uh, appreciate all of you tuning in. Uh, for everyone watching, um, you know, the whole goal here is for you to take away something it's for you to take away something new, learn, understand what blockchain is and how people are applying it. Uh, so first things first, um, Arnold, thank you for, for jumping on. If you mind doing a, a quick little introduction of, of name, title, and, and who you work for, that'd be great. Great. Hi, Adam. Thanks for, uh, for having us on here. Um, as you said, I'm Arnold. I'm from uh, LTO Network. I'm the software architect, uh, thinking of the nitty gritty, diving deep into the technical, uh, technical stuff. Um, yeah, and I hope to, to be able to, to take you on that journey uh, here. Awesome, awesome. Again, appreciate you, you know, joining us. We've had so many interviews. Um, times have been a little, little tough, right, for the last couple months. Everybody's at home. And we thought, why not? You know, let's, let's bring in some partners of ours. LTO is part of our university program. They're doing big things in, in, in Europe and all over the world. Um, so we're just blessed to have them, uh, to have them with us. Again, the overall arching goal of this conference uh, was to bring you uh, reality, uh, bright minds in the, not only in the crypto space, but just bright minds in general that, that, are, that are working on some of the development efforts that, that we're uh, trying to move forward and progress. Um, you know, they're adding value to the ways that we might do business in the future. And so with that being said, let's kind of separate the, the noise from the facts. Um, Arnold, you know, let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, Prior to getting into you know blockchain, what um, what were you doing before you got into blockchain? There, we have a lot of students right now watching it and maybe thinking about careers and or you know middle of the pack understanding what's going on uh, with, with different backgrounds. But if you don't mind, kind of you know what's been your journey prior to LTO and uh, maybe prior to blockchain and how you and then how you got into blockchain. Yeah, so I've been a, a software engineer for, well, basically all my life uh, since I was, I was 16, working on various projects, um, very much started on the first, uh, the first big uh, web boom back in the, uh, in the late uh, 1990s, um, when the internet was really brand new and everything was about building a decentralized applications surfing them through the uh, through the internet uh, so I've be, really been part of uh, part of that um, fr from then of course everything kind of slowed down uh, during uh, during the early uh, 2000s and 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 we really saw the the growth but from uh, technical um, new innovations it was it was kind of doing more of, of the old. Um, and that's why I'm really happy to, to be able to now be part of this, uh, this new blockchain movement, which is really brand new, where we get to um, re reinvent some of the, some of the things and, and really be part of this, this new movement. Yeah, nice. No, I think everybody's kind of kind of been in that journey. And so I guess, you know, what ultimately excites you about, about the blockchain space? And I'm sure this is going to spill into kind of the, the technical aspects and, and maybe the possibilities. Uh, but yeah, what, what excites you, you know, coming, you know, when, when you joined blockchain or, uh, you know, kicked it off in, in the technical aspect? So the, the whole idea from the internet was being able to do something in a decentralized way, giving power back to, to the people. Um, and along the way, the internet kind of lost that feeling and everything became centralized and became um, a part of, of these this, this big corporations uh, uh, play things. So I'm glad that the blockchain now gives everybody a new chance 
to work on, on this decentralized uh, uh, network and this decentralized world. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think this is kind of a good transition into, you know, why maybe, how did you land with LTO um, or how, you know, how did you join LTO network? And then what's the motivation you know, behind, behind your team and behind your project? Yeah, so I think LT, LTO has quite a different story from most companies because we didn't start out as a uh, blockchain company at all. Um, we started out um, as a centralized company doing um, uh, workflow automation. And basically our premise was that, hey, we can do your workflows, but you can host your own data. So that worked well, but the clients uh, wanted guarantees about data integrity from us. And you, you can understand that's really difficult to do because how can you ensure data integrity if you don't actually control the data yourself? So we started using blockchain not from a novelty, but really from a necessity. Um, but that, that gave us our first step into this, uh, this space and we started looking further, okay, what year was this? What, what year would you say this was? Because you were centralized and, and then you kind of, you know, blockchain came about. What, what, what time frame are we in right now? This, this was 2016. Okay. Um, and we were really basically only using anchoring to ensuring uh, data integrity. Um, and for, yeah, for the, for the rest, there wasn't too much blockchain involved, but we could uh, show our clients, okay, uh, this data, even though you're, you're hosting it yourself, we can ensure that um, it hasn't been uh, manipulated, tampered with in any, any way. And were you following um, Bitcoin or, or blockchain like from 2008 or anything like that? Or Ethereum prior to the, uh, you know, your guys' rolling of, of decentralization? Um, a, a, a bit, a bit. Privately, I was, I have been, been following it since I think 2011, 2010, 2011. Um, and then a little bit more professionally from uh, probably 2015, something, uh, something like that. And, and what, were, what were your thoughts around 2010, 11 when you read it? I mean, there's so many, you know, everybody had their own thoughts, right? I came across it in 2013. And at that time, I was just I, right off the bat. I was at the bank actually during that period of time, um, and it, you know, I kind of related it to money. And I've heard the other people say, you know, they thought it was magic money, and and I, I kind of thought the same thing until until you really understood like what was going on. Uh, what was your initial thought on Bitcoin? I guess in in twenty ten. To be honest, I didn't get it. I thought it was it was just a, a scam. It was just a Ponzi scheme. I didn't, didn't get the concept at all. Uh, I had some friends who are really enthusiastic uh, about it, who really urged me to, to read up about it, to follow it. But to be honest, uh, I, I didn't understand it from, from a, a broader sense. And I thought the whole thing was just very, very suspicious. Were there a lot of meetups, you know, events going on? Because you're out there in Amsterdam, correct? Yes, I am. Yeah. And, and yeah, was there a lot of, cause I know I'm here in San Francisco and I've met quite a few people, right. Where, uh, Bitcoin was taking off and they were, you know, throwing meetups, you know, here in the city or, you know, here in the Bay area, which there was like, you know, less than five people. And I heard like in New York, you know, less than five people. What was, was there any traction any community traction in your neck of the woods? No, not that I'm aware of. Not not at that time. It was really, um, yeah, people knowing each other, talking about it, talking about about it. But um, yeah, there wasn't there wasn't really a, a Amsterdam community at that uh, at that time. At least not that I'm uh, I'm aware of. Yeah, interesting. So then, so then, 2011. You know, you're kind of like, you know, what is this? And then, when did you start? You said you got into it in 2015, but in between those years, you were you were uh, doing other 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 uh, projects yes i was doing other projects i wasn't it was still kind of uh, on my radar but not uh, not really i was i wasn't really working with it doing anything uh, uh, with it and then in 2015 um i came uh, became in contact uh, with it again uh, mostly uh, because of of um 
uh, we were doing digital contracts. And then, of course, we heard about the smart contracts. So we started looking at, at them and seeing, hey, is this something that we can actually dive into? Is this something, something for us? Yeah, that, uh, interesting. Um, and then leading up to that, and the reason why I'm asking this because, you know, for our viewers out there, but, you know, blockchain, obviously the components of blockchain have been around for decades, right? Cryptography and distributed systems and all that. And so it, it's not new in terms of, you know, maybe some of the, you know, traditional computer science, you know, environment. Uh, but it's kind of snowballed right when when when, uh, when Bitcoin came out. So I'm just trying to put it in perspective for our viewers here um, that it's 2020 now. You know, it's this kind of period of Bitcoin and peer-to-peer -peer stuff uh, publicly, and it's still not that you know widely known. Uh, but it's been around for you know 12 years, right? You know, the space that we're in has been around now for 12 years. Um, and so now you're joining LTO Network, and you just mentioned that you know, you were working on a different kind of product or scheme, the design was more central, centralization. And now you're, you, you know, from your experience of 2010, 11, and then when did you start putting the pieces together of, hey, this might be a solution as we pivot. And you mentioned workflows originally, and then your, your I think your clients were discussing, like, can you manage, can you, how do you, you know, secure this, this data? And so what, how, what was that process amongst the team on hey look, you started looking for options and then and wh where did it go from there and then you know decentralization came about yeah so we were doing workflows and we came more and more across um uh, clients who had uh, multiple participants that were part of the of that that workflow different different organizations that that want to join in but there was really nothing for that all, all the workflow automation was focused on um, automating the processes of a single single organization. So we started looking in in, in that and initially doing something like that uh, in a centralized uh, way, which technically works. But when you come into into politics, it becomes more difficult. Uh, like who owns this data? Who controls those processes? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we started looking into blockchain. Um, as a way to solve that, to say, okay, you know, yes, we want to uh, join and automate this process uh, together, but we don't want to give um, all the permissions and, and the ownership to one of these, uh, these companies. You know, we're doing this uh, together uh, as, as, a, as a group. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I, I've had some conversations this week, right, for the last 10 days. And a lot of the, um, I would say, projects that have been here, you know, for, for quite some time, early days, um, and even some other individuals that um, have taken on kind of the blockchain, you know, effort, it all stemmed from really a problem, right? And, and, and then, you know, having a problem and then looking at the tools around it, as opposed to the other way, like you just mentioned, you had, you know, a different, um, a, a different architecture design, and then there was a problem that rose and then you found it. And it's just kind of interesting that, you know, today everybody's trying to run POCs and, and pilots and, and some of the success rates are really low. Right. And everybody's trying to understand, you know, how to use it. Um, and it's very difficult, but some of the successful projects stem from, a, you know, a problem and then really using the tools around it to solve it rather than building a tool you know, to go find a problem. So, so it's kind of, it's kind of interesting there. Um, and, you know, I, it looks like we have Galen here to, to join us, uh, CTO and co-founder of, uh, of Mousebelt, uh, helping us throw this conference. Galen, this is Arnold here from LTO Network, one of our BEA members. Oh, hey, nice to meet you, Arnold. Hi, Galen. Uh, so, yeah, we were just, uh, we're just chatting. We're kind of going through the journey of, of Arnold here. Um, LTO Network was first centralized, dealing with workflows, and then, now we're to the point where, um, you know, some of their clients have special requests and, and now they're identifying solutions on, on how to do that. So we're kind of at the beginning of, of this LTO journey. Um, so I didn't mean to cut you off, Arnold, but so now you have all these clients asking, right, about how to solve this. So now you're bringing this in and, and what were the options at that point to, what was blockchain, I guess, at that point? You know, what were you looking at to integrate, this, obviously, before you maybe designed your own? 
Yeah, so at that point, we were, we were really looking at, at blockchain uh, as a way to um, allow multiple stakeholders to, to participate in this, this process. For them, it was really never about blockchain. They couldn't care uh, less, but it was about uh, controlling their own part of the process, owning their own uh, data, um, especially because uh, GDPR was already on the radar at that moment. So and you had these roles, you had the process, you have, had the controllers, and they were really worried about um, moving that to, to a, a central centralized space where uh, they would no longer have uh, yeah, control over data that they should put, supposed to be controlling or securing. And so what was the option? What kind of technical options did you look into? I think at that point, Ethereum was out. Um, uh, there might have been some other chains. You know what was out? There's probably a lot of a few chains coming. I think Ethereum came out in 2014. Um, did you look at Bitcoin as well as a, you know, the, the architecture design or what, what was going on through your team's um, thoughts there and takes on how to implement it? Yeah, we, we looked at we looked at uh, um, some some different uh, projects, especially uh, a lot of, uh, at, at Ethereum. Um, even looking around at the problem that it was uh, completely public, um, but we we quickly found that it wasn't really a good uh, way to solve uh, to solve this issue um, because it was really about um, executing the, these codes on, on, on basically uh, uh, a lot of a lot of notes and solving problems like that, and that wasn't really the problem that our clients were uh, were having, which really uh, wanted to run this process together with a small group and didn't want the whole world or at least anybody, uh, everybody on the network to participate in that. You're right, and I think for for some of the viewers out here, you know, the audience of of understanding what blockchain does, right? It's it's a public ledger. So this is some of the dilemmas that are going on with the enterprise front and, you know, consortiums, right, that, that are forming um, to really understand how they're going to implement and integrate this stuff uh, for the benefit of, of them, but also the other stakeholders, uh, you know, the parties. I think the underlying factor of blockchain is trust. Um, and that's kind of what it's built for. So here we are, you're looking at Ethereum and, and it's, it's not really working. Um, so I think maybe we can go full blown here and get technical, Arnold, if you want, on you know what were the next steps to start developing uh, LTO. Yes, yeah, so we started looking at our own workflow uh, engine, looking at ways to um, to to make that into to a decentralized uh, into the centralized engine. So the first important thing was looking at making it uh, deterministic. Um, so if uh, all, when all the clients are running the same uh, events, then they must have the same conclusion and get to the same state. So we were really lucky in that uh, aspect that our workflow engine, um, yeah, it was fairly easy to do that because it was based on uh, finite state machines. So it just need to take out some of the some of the logic that we had, some of the randomness that was was possible to make it fully deterministic. And from that, we could um, add uh, event sourcing uh, to it to really take that, that centralized uh, engine that we had and make it uh, run decentralized um, over, a, over a network. So your, your um, uh, state machine, is this state machine replicated on each participant in the network, each of their devices? Yes, it is. So it basically works based on, on event sourcing. So the events are shared um, among the participants and they execute it um, so they get to the same state on the, on the state machine. Yeah. Okay. And how does each participant of the network know that they've caught up with each other participant of the network, that one isn't a few transactions behind or uh, how, how does everyone know the correct state? Yeah, so this is, it's a pitch peer, uh, a pitch peer network. So rather than having a global network, we have um, a hybrid blockchain. So we've got a global um, public part and then we've got a private uh, 
uh, a private part where we have events changed that are shared only between the participants and they get uh, they basically get uh, uh, pushed so ev every time an event happens it gets pushed to all the uh, the other participants okay so people in these event chains are only subscribed to a particular set of events and they're not concerned with what the network overall is doing and they maintain state on this main chain do i understand this correctly um yeah no, they don't even um maintain state on the on the main chain so the the main um global blockchain it's just there uh, for consensus so you can kind of imagine it like uh, git um where you have your different git repositories which hold their whole event uh, chain and you can have multiple of these um of these event chains on one uh, machine um, only the problem if you if you have a decentralized system like it is that there is no consensus so if there's some kind of conflict um, you would need to uh, solve that manually and what what we do is we use the public blockchain um, to apply consensus uh, on the the private chain so every event is anchored to the to the public chain and basically the order of of hashes for these events that you find on the public chain is used to see uh which event happens uh first and thus which uh branch is considered uh, to be the correct branch and which events needs to be rebased in case of a uh, conflict okay so how often is state synced from these event chains to the main chain um every time that you create a new uh event you first um uh, anchor it on the on the global chain so you anchor it you create a hash you anchor it and then you broadcast it okay so um i guess just for uh anyone watching uh why would um i guess what's most optimal about this approach um why would someone do this over using something like ethereum or uh an existing blockchain solution i think the major benefit is that um you have these uh these small event chains uh for a single process which is just shared uh, among the participants so if you have a process um, all the other parties in the network, they don't know about it. They don't need to know about it because they're not participating uh, in it. So from a pri privacy point uh, of view, um, you have a lot more control. Also, because each process has its own chain, you can choose to remove the whole chain once the process is over. And that's also important for, for privacy. So um, even because even if you have a consortium chain, then the data and the events are shared uh, among all the participants of that, those, uh, that consortium and that's not always what you want um, from a, uh, a privacy uh, perspective you really only want to share the data with the, the parties that need that need to have that the parties that are involved okay um yeah that, that makes sense absolutely um I guess my, my next question is, uh, is there a way for any of these event chains to interact with each other? Say if Adam and I are an event chain and you and I have an event chain and I want to access from within this event chain with Adam some of the data that I have in ours, is there a way to do this on LTO? Um, there is but um from from uh, a basic point of view each event chain lives on its uh, on its own um so i can always access and reference to another event chain another specific point in uh, in there and if uh two or more parties have access to both chains they can go and see that okay i've accessed that, that data and put it on this chain did i do that correctly um but there's no direct uh, uh interaction uh, uh between them okay 
Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, users of LTO, uh, what type of companies, uh, projects, um, uh, different users have you seen interested in LTO so far as opposed to other blockchain solutions? Like what type, what uh, types of businesses are really interested in this? Yeah, so we work a lot with um, uh, government organizations, uh, government, semi-government organizations that have different stakeholders that all have their own um, uh, obligations, um, as well as as with uh, uh, yeah different uh, different consortiums that also don't want to share uh, the data specifically with their uh, competitors. Are there any other chains that that are similar? or taking this approach? Um, n did not really. Um, this is, this, from that point of view, this is quite a novel, uh, novel approach. We do see, of course, chains with, which have side chains. And you can do kind of the sim uh, something similar, but um, as a, a, like a major uh, point of focus, I think where we are, uh, yeah, um, a novelty net. And would you say that, you know, you've been working with these types of entities, right? Organizations and enterprises. Um, from the get go, you were, that was already your target client profile market was enterprises? Um, yes, it, it kind of has, no, well, to be honest, from a get go, um, our targets were more um, uh, um, legal officers, law officers, and things like that, because we were really focusing on um, doing these uh, legally binding contracts uh, on the blockchain. Um, though we've, we've shifted away from that because we found that, um, well, basically not all the stakeholders were uh, too interested in, in um, uh, this approach. You can imagine if, if you're a law of us, then uh, automating a, a lot of the, the work away is not in your best uh, uh, interest. You know, that basically that cuts into the, into the bottom line. So it was, that was really a hard sell. Um, but for, for government uh, uh, organizations, you know, sa saving uh, effort, saving money, that's, uh, that's always a win, uh, win for them. So we kind of pivoted uh, towards a, a, different, a different set of clients. And this whole concept, right, kicked off in, uh, I think you said 2016 or 17, is that when all of this was getting put into place? I think LTO launched in 2017, but you guys were working prior to that? On this. Yes, right. so since, since 2014, we were working on, um, on our uh, workflow engine. And in 2017, um, we started more focusing on blockchain and really took off after doing a, a hackathon for the uh, Dutch government, uh, where we won a, uh, won a project with multiple stakeholders from uh, the Ministry of Justice. Um, and from, yeah, that kind of made us really shift focus towards uh, blockchain. Nice, nice. Um, no, no, really interesting stuff. And, and you know, I, I want to make sure that we kind of stay on track here because I know you want to talk about some things too, right, um, Arnold? And, and first and foremost, um, how are things going working with the government? Uh, are you guys satisfied where you're at? Are they happy with blockchain? Is there a lot of interest in them integrating your, your solution? Um, and, and what's the feedback there? I want, I want our viewers to understand you have been working on this technology, you know, with specifications, and now you, you're working with, uh, you know, local public um, agencies and governments. What's their feedback? And, and are they coming to you? Are you going to them? How is this all snowballing into actual usage, applications, yeah, basically you have to apply to, um, oh, sorry, I don't know how these are called in, in English, um, but the, basically they are, they are public um, assignments and you have to sign into, uh, into them and present your uh, case. And then there's always uh, also uh, competitions like hackathons uh, 
um, that you participate uh, participate up. Um, so within any uh, European government, it's really not allowed just to grant a project to a company because you like them. You always have to participate in some sort of, of uh, uh, competition where you show what you have and, and um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, interesting. You know, there's a lot of things going on and um, which kind of ties into some of this, the, these other technical aspects that you're tackling here. Uh, regarding regarding SSI, and I think Galen's going to kind of enjoy this as well. Um, regarding you know self sovereign identity, what are you guys tackling on, on that front? And, and if you could s and explain to the audience what the goals are there and what's the motivation. Yeah, so what we really noticed, uh, we were we were doing a lot of uh, proof of concepts um, where you're basically only dealing with um, other blockchain enthusiasts. But when you want to try to move into, into a broader scope, a uh, broader adoption, you're dealing with um, specialists from all other uh, kinds of uh, fields. And uh, what we noticed that they really value um, working with, with uh, standards. Um, so also from an SSI uh, uh, point of view, uh, we're all about managing your own data, owning your own data, um, controlling your own, own data. And that's also, of course, um, one of the key facts of, of SSI. But trying to reinvent um, basically how the data is being formatted, how the data is being shared, uh, that's a problem that doesn't really tie into uh, existing uh, software and existing frameworks. So... I think that's, that has been a realization that we come across um, um, most of, of 2018 and 2019, that if you want to transition from um, uh, a, a POC into a project that has wide adoption, that you need to uh, comply with all the regulations and with all the standards. You cannot just build something within your own blockchain bubble. And what's been the take on that? Like, why not just go cent? cent uh, why not just be centralized? Uh, what are the what are the issues there right now? And then the standardization. I mean, how's that moving forward? Uh, they've accepted that. Um, we're still in the POC. Have you developed this type of salute, this type of product? Yeah, I, I think there's actually a really big opportunity for a decentralization, especially here in Europe with GDPR, because if you take control. Um, of the of the data, if you assign yourself as as data com a controller rather than a processor, then you take up a lot of uh, responsibility. So if something goes wrong, even if it's out of your uh, control, um, yeah, you're still responsible. You're still responsible of solving it, and you're still responsible in terms of uh, yeah, getting fines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, every co company, um, rather than what, uh, companies wanting to, to take it control towards them, are looking at ways how they can participate without actually having to uh, take too much of this, um, uh, of this responsibility. And does this tie into your current framework of, of, uh, of architecture and design? Have you guys had to tweak anything on the LTO front? Yeah, yes, I really think that what we're working on now is um, complying more and more with existing standards. So what, what we've built is working if everybody is basically using uh, our application and our data formats, but trying to sell that and trying to say, okay, you know, you did it like this, now you need to change everything because you need to adhere to our formats. That's really a, a, a big issue, and I think that's, that's something that we've experienced um, uh, last year and more and more products are also experiencing now. Yeah, and I think that's a learning lesson right there in itself is that you guys, you know, the whole journey, right, has been evolution, you know, making pivots, uh, critical pivots to, you know, allowing a, a streamline to integrate with LTO, you guys have been able to get creative to allow your end users um, 
more of a, a process, right? And, and you just mentioned POCs, and I mentioned this earlier, a lot of, right now, the adoption and success rate, it, there's a lot of barriers. And, and I think you're touching on one of them, that everybody was competing for the last six years and, and still probably competing on, on what chain to use and, you know, tweaking the, the features and trying to make it better. But going back to the use case of, of finding a problem and then, and then tweaking your tech for it, right? And this is, and you brought up another example right now of standardizing. You guys had one way. Nobody, you would have to sell, well, the first attempt was with the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the law, the, the police officers and all that, right? And then that didn't work out. So you guys pivoted to find another, another use case. And now here you are again, figuring it out really quickly, like, hey, we can't sell this thing. Um, and, and again, I'm trying to tell this to the audience of, of what you're doing, you know, in the blockchain space to really spur uh, not only innovation, but, but further adoption into the masses. And so that's an interesting point that you decided to use these standards and then and tweak your tech for it. Um, that way, uh, the end user or, you know, the people, you know, the entities that are going to integrate it, it's pretty seamless for them, right? Because isn't that a problem? Like, we don't want to rebuild this whole system. You know, we don't want to have to switch everything and all that. So it seems like you guys are trying to streamline that. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, ex ex exactly. And I, I think I think this is really a problem, uh, to be honest, in the blockchain space. Like people are doing POCs and being really proud uh, of them and, and you know, patting themselves on the back, like, look at these very cool POC that we did and blah, blah, blah. blah. But in reality, you know, we really want to grow to um, production, world adoption and, and yeah. Um, yeah, we really have to to make steps for uh, for that, and that's that's really the journey that that we as LTO are on right now. So moving away from doing these well cool, but uh, ultimately uh, yeah, kind of pointless uh, POCs and getting adoptions where we're being used by a very broad audience. And so, what in term in your terms, in your opinion, like where are we uh, with the tech? And then the POCs and actual adoption and production, would you say that um, the technology that you guys have is ready to go into full production? Would you say there needs to be more education um, to understand that they can really fully in implement this stuff? Uh, where's the fear or where do you see the, the continued barriers? Obviously, you know, we're not trying to, you're not trying to sell blockchain, uh, the whole platform anymore. It's kind of like, let us tweak it to you what's kind of that synergy looking like uh, and have those barriers for LTO network. It seems like might be coming down a little bit. The challenges might be, you know, more willing to, to collaborate. Yeah. What, what, what we've tried to do is we've tried to sell uh, a blockchain and try to sell our formats uh, to companies say, okay, you know, this has, has benefits and you need to use uh, uh, that. That has been only working to up to a certain point where you're dealing with, basically blockchain enthusiasts. Yeah, yeah. But um, when you're dealing with people outside of, of, of our field, you're dealing with a lot of skeptics. Um, so rather than saying, okay, you know, you have to move to us, we're making the move towards them, saying, okay, we're working with open standards, you can integrate it. Yes, it's blockchain, but you won't even, basically you won't even notice, uh, notice it. This just works because we're using the standards that everybody's using on the, on the internet. And would you say, have the, like, Galen, I'll let you chime in shortly. And would you say have the dominoes have fallen a little bit um, from like one client to two client, you know, are they catching on now that you're, you know, we're, again, like you said, we're all in this bubble. And so we're excited. But once you step out of there, if you go talk to somebody else, you know, they don't know what it is. Uh, we're talking to enterprises as well that, you know, we're, we're agnostic and, and we're trying to streamline adoption as well on, on the integration front to make it as easy as possible uh, because we feel, like you said, the POCs, they're, they're so uh, time consuming, resource intensive. If we can have, for every one POC that, that's been done in the past, if we could ramp up 10 to 20 a year, then it would be worth it. We'd probably have more data and then more use cases and applications. But right now, it seems like a lot of the discussions are, what is your use case? But that's not how it is. Like you said, you got to like tailor um, your uh, resources to them and move over to them 
to help them understand it and visualize it and see how it works. Scanlon, you, you want to say something? Oh, so, um, yeah, I guess my, my question was uh, specifically around um, uh, what, what, what things have you done to make it more blockchain fit more into like a standard workflow? for like a technology, like what have it, has it been like different connectors to attach to it, like a database? Has it been providing API bindings? Like what have you done to make it more accessible for companies? Yeah, so, so that's, that's actually something that we already did uh, a time ago, making the API bindings, making it accessible, making REST APIs. Um, so th that's working up to a certain point, but right now we're really moving towards um, focusing on open standards uh, like um, X509 for uh, for certificates, where you're saying, okay, we not want it's not just this is uh, this type of encryptions, but you can actually use the libraries that you're already using. You can use your uh, PKA uh, infrastructure, and now also apply that to the to the blockchain. So it's really about using the standards that they're already comfortable with and applying that to to our blockchain. Okay, so this eventually becomes something where you find technology stacks that companies are using and it becomes something almost drag and drop in where they're not spending any time porting things over. Exactly, so basically it's, it's where the things that they're already doing and now they can add some decentralization in, uh, in there, but they don't need to, to basically change everything or, or even like work with specifically with our uh, APIs and our data formats, but is really working with the data um, in the way that they are already doing. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I, I know when I've um, done some proof of concept implementations with um, Ethereum or uh, Fabric, people always get kind of caught up on the concept of creating a wallet and creating a card or something in the system which represents a key pair that they're using to push data on. So it's actually a really cool approach to use something that the companies are more used to. Yeah. Um, and, and what's been, and what have they said about that? Because I think you said a lot of things um, up to a certain point, right? The tech gets you to this certain, or the tech gets you to this certain point education and, and knowledge gets you maybe a little bit on there and gets you a little bit further in the door. What have they been saying with your approach? Um, and do they hear other chains trying to, you know, have them integrate onto them? Um, well, it's um, for, for us, we, we just get early feedback of this of course, because as I said, this is the journey that we're going through now. I think it's interesting to, to share that as we're actually going through that. Um, and what you really see is a, a, a real split where you have the uh, blockchain enthusiasts that are re either really into uh, a fabric or really into Ethereum that say, okay, no, but how we're doing is much better than uh, everything that exists nowadays. And why would we move back basically to these old and, and, and sometimes uh, suboptimal standards. Uh, but then you have the people that are not working with blockchain on a daily basis that are finding it, um, yeah, are saying, okay, finally we have something that we can actually work with and something that doesn't uh, demand us of throwing out everything that you've built up in the last 10 years. That's great, and I'm sure that's, positive right for, for your team to, to kind of hear that where hey here's a team LTO that, that we can factor in that we don't have to like change so much of our infrastructure we can just kind of plug and play right yes yeah, so the, inter the interesting thing is that the typical typical group that is very much in favor of, of using blockchain is now kind of skeptic towards um, a, the LTO approach <laughs> uh, people who are, are might have are typically skeptic of, of blockchain are now more positive and more open to it. We, so, can't, win. we can't win. Yeah, it, on one way you can't win, on the other way, you know, this might be a good path where actually these two groups are coming more close uh, together. And really, we really hope that we can achieve that. 
I do have another question around the approach you're taking pros and cons, or not, maybe not pros and cons, but the approach you took to where you went this route of, of uh, you know, uh, moving towards the end user and some of these other past projects that maybe have tried to, you know, bring them onto their network. Is one harder than the other? Um, and I'm, for the audience, you know, watching here, we've heard of all of these blockchain companies, but I don't know if we've heard anybody take this same approach, right? So if you can go back in time or, or tweak some things, you know, the way you're doing it, is it, is it uh, maybe not easier or harder, but is, there, is it efficient compared to maybe obviously developing this certain blockchain and hoping, you know, build and, and they will follow? Well, if, if you're looking at building POCs, if that's what you want, then taking the, the blockchain as a bubble uh, approach will definitely get you further. You have these uh, enthusiasts uh, on, your, uh, on your site, which are, are in, in these blockchain uh, teams. So um, it, that's definitely easier, but you have this, this glass roof uh, that, that you will need to break through, and you can't do that um, when you're only stuck in your own uh, in your own bubble, so we've decided. Okay, you know we don't want to do POCs for the rest of our lives. We want to to really build uh, a software that everybody's gonna uh, use. It's gonna have a widespread uh, adoption. So that's the more difficult path, but it's the path that will take you further eventually. And where do you see? What's going to come first on the adoption front? There's various adoptions. There's, um, you know, retail consumer adoption, maybe on the cryptocurrency side, there's enterprise adoption, you know, integrating this stuff. There's maybe some people compare adoption to understanding, you know, more of the people understanding what, what we're working with here. Yeah. How do you see adoption playing out now that we're in 2020? You guys have been around for four years. Um, Bitcoin's been around 12, Ethereum, you know, six. Um, I would say that that sounds like a long time as far as when Bitcoin kicked off and maybe Ethereum and maybe even yourselves. But I feel like just in the last few years, it's really picked up some steam on actual, you know, maybe the infrastructure is better. Where do you see like the, the adoption kicking in or, or maybe hockey sticking up um, or you might see it now or not for somebody said not for like another 10 years. And we can really predict, but. Yeah, I, I, I think um, what we really see is that consumers, they don't care. Okay. They, they simply don't care where their data is stored, to who controls it, they, they just don't care. When, it, when something goes wrong, they want a party to blame, and for the rest, you know, they, they don't care. So trying to focus your blockchain on consumers, I think that's going to be a really hard sell. Um, so you have to look they're not going to want to know about it, right? They, they're not going to want to know what, what's going on on the back end. They, they, they couldn't care less. I mean, it, it's the same as trying to sell the consumer about what, what database you're using or whatever. They, they don't care. They just care about, okay, you know, how is it looks and does it work and now they're no box. So they couldn't care less. Um, if you're, so what it really needs to come to, uh, come from a B2B uh, perspective. And I do think there are a lot of uh, opportunities there, especially um, when it concerns uh, about uh, owning data, controlling data, sharing uh, data, um, either from a, a point of uh, um, uh, privacy uh, and privacy regulations, um, and also from a, a point of uh, basically collaboration, automation, et, et cetera. So there are a lot of um, benefits to it. There are a lot of things that, that uh, can be streamlined, that can save companies money. Um, so I think you know, if you can show a company that this approach will save them uh, this amount of, of money in the long term, then they're always going to be interested. They, and also, of course, they don't care. Um, about blockchain, you know, if you move if you move outside the blockchain bubble, um, the organizations like, oh yeah, it's cool, whatever. But if you can't uh, show them that they will save money and how they will save money, ultimately, you know, it's just a vanity project, and and it won't, won't really go anywhere. 
And, and would you say that uh, they, they've adopted it? Maybe not in the full extent of, uh, like you said, the POCs, you know, there's tons of them and the, the success rate is low. We know that we've seen it, we've, we've heard it. Uh, but as far as like even the POC front, um, a lot of them are, you know, dipping their toe in the water, right? So would you say blockchains here, like how, how do you see the future playing out in, you know, the next five, 10 years? Do you think most enterprises are going to leverage the, the uh, leverage blockchain? I think it's still very, very early. Um, a lot of these POCs are really vanity projects are just showing like, hey, we're cool because we, we use blockchain. Um, if you look at projects that are actually saving co co uh, companies money, there are very few of them. Um, and to be honest, for most uh, uh, blockchain uh, companies, that's not even on their radar uh, uh, yet. So I think we have really have a long way to go. Um, and we really, you know, if we want to be taken seriously, um, as, as a field, as a group, we really need to, to work on that and show companies, okay, this is actually something useful, this is actually something you can, you can benefit from. And do you think the technology and the infrastructure is there to present that? Um, or do you, uh, obviously the technology will continue to evolve and get better, but as of right now, the tech that we do have, um, maybe as a group community, maybe you want to um, state from your side, even from LTO, is it good enough to, you know, kick it off? Um, uh, to be honest, I think it's, you know, it's really from a, um, we're really working it from, from a, a um, uh, uh, R&D uh, um, perspective. So finding things that work, finding things that, that might be uh, cool, that might have some, some benefit but we're not we're not really there yet um, there are a lot of things that uh, yeah have yet to be solved if you want to to run this uh, in in a lot uh, much bigger uh, bigger scale than we're doing now and you think we're headed in the right direction though i i think so i think so i think um what we do, what we're doing now, and the time, the time that we're experiencing now is really uh, beneficial. Um, also, I do think that you know now with Corona and with maybe the uh, economy struggling a little bit more, um, companies are more focused in actually, uh, yeah, showing the benefit of what they're doing rather than, than just running vanity products, and that should really help us in moving into the to the right direction. Yeah, no, I think that, that makes total sense. I'm just asking these questions because it's interesting times right now. And, and, and even in our space through the ups and through the downs, you know, the last five years, um, blockchain has been able to maintain some steady progress, right? I think we had the ICO craze, um, people raising tons of money and not shipping product or MVPs, you know, leading to the bear market, right? And then 2019 was going to be a recovery year and, um, I noticed that enterprises were jumping, you know, fortune 100 companies were, you know, definitely fortune 500 and even fortune, you know, 100 companies were already testing the waters. Um, and now here we are in 2020 and now we have the, the world's on fire and the pandemic's hit and everybody's at home. Uh, but we're still having conferences like this and, and teams are still chugging along. So I, I would agree that, you know, we're definitely headed in the right direction. Um, and, and I still agree to your point we need to f continue to find the value for, you know, the enterprise side, right? And so that we can drive this even more because the internal champions, like you said, uh, within these companies, sometimes they leave the job, the POCs fail, and then it's a hard sell to upper management. So we got to break some of those barriers to make it easier for management to, it's for it to be a no brainer. Although we all think it makes sense. Um, we need to really present the underlying cost savings, efficiency, you know, what's it going to do for them to, to make them uh, an advantage. What's your thought to, we're talking about a lot of these systems, leveraging blockchain. I know we got a, like, we've got a few couple more minutes on, we're talking about all these systems yet, even further down the road and, and 
blockchain also plays as an infrastructure uh, for IoT, right, and devices and that kind of data sharing as opposed to some, you know, we'll think of it as a peer-to-peer. Um, would you say blockchain's is that, that critical component for robots and autonomous cars and, and does your blockchain, um, does LTO network cater to that as well? Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if blockchain is actually a critical component for, uh, for that. As I said earlier, especially consumers, they, they don't really uh, uh, care um, about how that data is, is being uh, uh, managed. You know, when everything goes wrong, they want somebody to blame. And I think it's, it's more of a difficult sell to say, okay, it, it's on your device, it's part of the blockchain, nobody owns it, nobody controls it. So if something goes wrong, that's, that's on you. Um, and you have to deal with it yourself. So I think from that point of, 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 of uh, view, from that perspective, um, adding blockchain to um, more the IoT is, you know, might, might be a hard, uh, be proved to a hard sell, even though it makes, uh, from an ideological uh, point of view. Ideological? I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ideological point of view. Um, it makes a lot of, it makes a lot of, of sense. Yeah. So if, I think there's, there's um, a big gap between um, what's practical um, and what makes, uh, yeah, what, what's, what's actually sellable. Interesting. And, and so to kind of wind this down a little bit, what, what are the next steps for LTO right now um, to kind of maintain progress as, you know, the world slowed down? Uh, blockchain kind of is in a critical point, as you mentioned, during this time that, you know, can shed some light. Uh, you know, this can, this unfortunate scenario environment can maybe shed some light into our industry what's what are the next steps for lto and what, what's critical what's a critical turning point that, that you foresee maybe in 2020 uh with or 2021 what's coming up yeah so, so i think we're really at the point of, uh, of self-reflection looking back back at our projects seeing um what was successful in what cases did we actually uh, uh save uh, money for our for our clients and in what uh, projects was it fun but mo- ultimately more a uh, more a vanity uh, vanity project um, and and also where at projects that kind of got stuck at the the POC level um, we're looking at okay why did they get stuck and uh, what can we do with the feedback from from people without of outside of this uh, this blockchain community. Um, and how can we apply that to, to where we're going now for, for the next uh, uh, couple, coming years? And I think I, I asked you a bit ago, but is there a lot of requests coming into LTO Network from, from, the, from your maybe geographical region or, or globally? Is there a lot more requests of, hey, uh, we're thinking about you know, your project now or uh, we're thinking about this now? Um, do you see an uptick in, in interest um, now? Yeah, what, what we are noticing is that, well, basically, uh, um, because of, uh, of COVID, um, projects that were already in the pipeline now get more attention. Um, but we, we are seeing uh, a stricter focus on, okay, how can we actually apply this to uh, a streamline our processes and, and save uh, money? So where we had more of a vanity projects in the pipeline, I think people are more hesitant about those now. And projects that were in the pipeline where, uh, yeah, there's a better potential of, of savings, but maybe something that takes a little bit of extra uh, effort, um, they're getting pushed through now much, uh, much faster. Nice. Galen, do you have any last minute words while we kind of close up in the last couple of minutes? Um, yeah, let's see. Uh... I guess in terms of you, the development roadmap on LTO, what features are you guys rolling out next? What are you What are you guys working on, and what are you most excited about? Yeah, so we've recently rolled out um, associations where you can have associations between uh, addresses, and uh, that's really applicable to so many cases. We, you can use this base for SSI. You can uh, use it for track and trace. You can use it to uh, see if you've got the latest version of, uh, of documents. 
So there's a lot of things we, that we can do with it. And we also really want to educate others what they can do with, uh, with that. Um, we've added another transaction type called the sponsored accounts. Um, because we really found that uh, organizations don't really want to deal with tokens. Uh, on a uh, on a network, and it's, this is a way to to solve uh, to solve that. Then, what I said earlier, we're going to focus more on standards. So, for instance, um, something that we want to add is uh, a publishing uh, X509 uh, certificate, so so SSL certificates, email certificates, etc. Uh, on the on the chain, that gives really a a, a anchor point. Of entities to say, hey, the, uh, yeah, um, this address belongs to us, and we can prove it, um, and that gives a lot of uh, more uh, capabilities to uh, your networks in terms of, of trust. Um, and we also want to look at um, uh, different ways of um, of different um, uh, cryptographic uh, algorithms. We currently do ED two five five one nine. Um, but we're noticing that you really need to tie into uh, basically um, what, what companies are already uh, uh, using, uh, like uh, ETSA, RSA, etc. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, that's some. That's uh, definitely some really cool stuff on the roadmap. Um, in terms of actually the address association, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? How that works exactly? Um, this could be kind of cool for some of the students working on the hackathon. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, maybe, can can we actually go into to uh, one of the slides? Um, let me let me see if I can do that. I'm gonna go to one of the last slides. Okay, uh, it says it disabled uh, screen sharing. Adam. What's that? Um, can you enable that? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, there we go. So yeah, the the concept of association is actually quite simple, but um, you can imply, uh, apply it to so many things. So you have two addresses, and an address is basically calculated from your uh, public key. So you've got your public key, it's has and that forms an address. And an association is a uh, basically a directional acknowledgement that has a specific type and a hash so you can use that within the client uh, within the client to uh, yeah, interpret it at uh, the uh, meeting so I can see the next hold on let me do it like this actually So if you have a certificate, um, each certificate uh, contains a, uh, a public key and you can calculate uh, the address uh, from that. And then you can create an association to that. So saying, okay, we own this public key or um, this address uh, is a, an employee of our company and he has uh, certain permissions. So you can, uh, delegate authority uh, on the on the blockchain. So, but, but what's interesting is basically you can create an address for anything because any data you can hash, you can associate an address for. So, what I said earlier, you can do things like uh, a track and trace where you create an association towards an, an address of, of a product where, for instance, you when for instance you've received. Uh, it. Yeah, and 
I think if you compare it to uh, non-fungible tokens, it's, it's much more versatile because you can have bi-directional acknowledgement. So for instance, one party says, hey, I uh, delivered it, and the other party says that, okay, I received it, and it needs to be correct. Um, so that, that really makes it uh, follow the real world more. And of course, you can do something like friendships, where also you want to have this bi-directional uh, acknowledgement. So this is a new type of transactions that we uh, just added, and we think it's gonna yeah be really really useful. Oh, very cool! Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely. Um, any students watching at or watching this right now, this would be a cool thing to explore during the hackathon. Yeah, maybe Arnold, we're, we're throwing a hackathon. Maybe we can throw up an LTO challenge. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, we're having this hacking on next week. Uh, you know, we'd love to touch base on this and maybe we can get this out to the students, right? We've, we've kind of tailored it to our 80 plus partners on the university side and um, thought it'd be wise for them to uh, kind of hack away with our partners. And so this might be something we can propose. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I think we're running up on time here, but a couple lessons learned just for the audience, you know, tuning in and watching this was that it seems like LTO is definitely um, a leader in the pack in the sense of evolving with not only the times, but working with, with their clients. And what I mean, what I mean by that is not putting a, you know, a, a round, you know, circle into a square peg and, and really being flexible to, to provide tools and solutions that make the end user want to integrate this stuff. And I think that's a big challenge right now and a big barrier for a lot of teams and a lot of projects. Um, not only from the blockchain side, but outside of our ecosystem of of uh, non-traditional, you know, or traditional types of governments and, and all that. And I think we need to help them understand, you know, we just want to come in and make this as seamless as possible. We don't want to maybe, you know, have you get rid of your whole old uh, legacy systems just for blockchain. We want to, you know, make sure that we have standards in place so that everybody's comfortable. And I think those are some of the lessons that, that I took away today. Um, Galen, your thoughts before we end this? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, this I, I, I would I would agree with that. This is a really cool um, approach you guys have taken, being very adaptable to what companies are trying to look for. Uh, yeah, and I'd be I'd be really curious to see uh, who's using it next, how it's spreading. And uh, yeah, we share similar views here. And Arnold, for the students kind of watching, anything you want to share with them on? you know, how to get involved or what your thoughts are to, you know, carry on the blockchain way. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of people that are at the beginning stages of going down this rabbit hole. And there's a lot of uh, people in the middle of the pack trying to decipher, you know, what's noise and what's not, what's your take, anything you want to share with them before we conclude? Yeah, I think, I think a good approach is not actually to start with blockchain and see, okay, how can I fit this in? but just start building something, something useful and see, okay, where do I run to uh, some limitations of decentralization? How can I apply blockchain to overcome those uh, limitations? So don't start with blockchain, start with uh, a solution, start with what you're actually building and then see, uh, do I need to apply blockchain and what are the benefits of it? And then, and I'll, and I'll echo that. You know, a lot of these interviews and panels that we have had, again, separating the noise from the facts. A lot of the successful ones, just like your team, um, took that approach. Right? It's not about blockchain. It's about understanding the problem and, and using all the tools and resources available, and then applying applying what you have. Um, and that's one of the trends that that I've noticed um, with all of these teams that have, you know, survived these these uh, volatile markets and and different, um, you know, technology bumps in the road that you guys have really taken um, a strong stance and, and, and been able to, to get past all that. So, uh, Arnold, I appreciate you taking, you know, time out of your day uh, to, to spend time with us here at Reimagine 2020. Um, I hope we can do this again, and we look forward to, to talking to you uh, sometime soon. Thanks for having me, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Galen. Oh, and uh, one last thing, Arnold, if you want to give a shout out or give any like direction to people looking to build on LTO, we can edit in a little section at the end if you want to point people to links or wherever they can find 
uh, info about LTO. Yeah, so please visit our website, LTO uh, ltonetwork.com. Uh, we've got documentation on docs.ltonetwork.com. And of course, we've got a Telegram group um, where you can ask any type of questions. Our whole team is available. So don't be afraid to come to us if you want to build something. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of the art in blockchain education and technological development all around the world. Reimagine 2020.